Well, hello! Hello! On behalf of the faculty and staff of East Tennessee State University, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. Tonight is a night in which we, as a campus, are going to come together to celebrate, to say thank you, but also to have a little bit of fun. Tonight is a night in which, as I look out across the room, I see individuals who are faculty, individuals who are staff, individuals who are students, individuals who are alumni, but individuals who carry forward the mission of this institution. And that's a mission of making a difference in the lives of the people of this region. I've had the great honor over the course of more than six years to work with someone who personifies that mission in a way that few can. Someone who's larger than life, someone who is a living rock star, and someone who, a number of years ago, made probably the worst radio show in the history of radio shows with me. <laughs> there was an idea that many faculty had shared with me to put together a show to give an opportunity for engagement. And the thought was we would put this show together, we'd have an opportunity to tell some stories, talk some about the university, and have some fun. So Dr. Dula and I had a radio show together. And my son said, Dad, this is the worst thing I've ever heard, because this guy's really good, and you're really boring. <laughs> and I think students all across this campus and faculty all across this campus would say that this gentleman is more than really good. This gentleman is something special. When you look at things that define institutions, we're defined by activities, but ultimately we're defined by people. And when you look at the impact that people have, it's through service. And that impact of service is more than service in ways that we traditionally define it. When this institution a number of years ago had a very difficult day because of incidents that occurred at Borchuk Plaza, who volunteered to lead campus conversations? Who brought hundreds of people together to structure a dialogue? Dr. Dula. When students were looking for questions of what happens in life when I graduate from college and I want to go on to graduate school and how do I get there, who volunteered to answer their questions? Dr. Dula. When it came time to have performances at our staff picnic, who volunteered? Dr. Dula. Occasionally he let me play Jane's Addiction, um, but they turned the volume down really low so you couldn't hear me. But that theme of volunteer strikes through a theme of service. And as an institution, I say thank you for your service, and I want to do something special. So if you all bear with me for one second. So, Dr. Dula, on behalf of the Board of Trustees and on behalf of the faculty and staff of East Tennessee State University, it's my honor to present you with this proclamation. Now, it's not the proclamation that's important. It's what the proclamation signifies. It signifies that each day in April, from this point forward in perpetuity, we as a university will come together for a day in the spring to celebrate service. Each year we'll celebrate faculty for their recognitions of service. Each year we'll celebrate staff, but the faculty member for whom that day of service will forever be known is Dr. Chris Dula, and each April we will celebrate the Dr. Chris Dula Day of Service here at ETSU, commemorating in perpetuity your service to the university. Dr. Dula, thank you for all that you do for ETSU. This class for six years running in charge of theater. So I learned something new every year. 
you can't see me. My uh, chewing back on its glass officially for six years running. Thank you. And when I first met this guy, he took me out to dinner. He apparently heard a few things about me being here. I said, he either got the best good old joy, good old boy job, network, job in history, because now you watch him from Grayville. But we have 50 candidates for president, and you only want to work for the Tennessee Board of Regents, so they either gave you the best job you ever got through the good old one network, or then now you're the best person for the job. I see lots of evidence of the latter and no evidence of the former. He gave up on his way back the presidency of UT, the Orange Fuel. Because it wasn't right for him. He wanted to be a place he could make a difference. And a place they told him what to do. So he's made a difference here. He's allowed me to make a difference here. And that is something I love to do. My neurosurgeon said, you should keep doing what you love while you go through treatment. I'm like, that's good. I think that's an honest order. Because you know what I love to do? Things I love. So I'm here doing stuff I love, which is the orientation and the teaching and the being in background class. He teaches me something every year. And he brings me up on stage to teach with him. We, every year, have a Martin Luther King Day where we do service. And I'm honored to be, have this day in it after me. But I always read a letter from a Birmingham jail on that day. And share something on social media, some quote from that worth reading, worth examining and studying and learning from. Because Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was special. We learned a lot from him, and we shall continue to do so as an institution. We will continue to serve this great region as we have. It's part of our joy, part of our mission. I think you see why Dr. Dula is so wonderful, because he referred to this as Pat Cronin's classroom. But for students who had the honor to come into this room, it was his classroom. It's now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Devin Ricker, a student of Dr. Dula's, who's going to talk a little bit about setting the stage for the film that we'll have the chance to view tonight. Thank you all for being here this evening as we have the opportunity to learn more about someone who has meant so much to us, someone who defines all that is beautiful and pure about this university, and someone who rocked Dokken before class, which we attempted to do here tonight. So Chris, thank you. Devin, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Nolan. Uh, I just want to tell a quick story before we get into the film. I want to tell about the first time that I ever met Dr. Dula. And that was just a couple of years ago when I was a freshman here at ETSU. And I remember just being lost on campus trying to find my way around. And I finally, I knew that I had a class here called Intro to Psychology in Brown Hall. And I had a couple of friends tell me that that was going to be the best class that I ever had. And I was skeptical. I'm just kind of a skeptical guy. but. There was something about this class, the way people spoke about it. It just, it touched their hearts in so many different ways. And so I had high expectations. I remember I got here to Brown Hall, 
And this is a really hard hall to navigate. So I, I ended up lost, and I ended up at this back door back here somehow. And I remember the door was shut, and all I could hear was it sounded like a party was on the other side. <laughs> there was people, like, screaming and having a good time and laughing, and there was loud rock music. And I was like, okay, maybe there is something to this class. So I walk through, and it's exactly what you expect, just a full room full of hundreds of people and have everyone having such a great time. And I'm a little bit nervous as a freshman, so I walk over and I find a chair, and I get a glimpse of Dr. Dula for the first time ever. And he's sitting on this stage with his legs crossed, and there's just an aura about him, something so brilliant. And he's controlling the whole room, and he's not even doing anything. He's sitting there, and all of a sudden, the music cuts off as class starts. He stands up. And he says, hello! Hello! Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I remember I was a little scared at first, but I caught on the second time. <laughs> and it didn't take me long to fall in love with this professor and for this class to become my favorite class through all of college. And because of that, it wasn't just our relationship didn't end when the class stopped when we had our finals. There was many more times after that. I love to go to his concerts at the Acoustic Hot Coffee House, see you dance, Casper, and, and just jam out with him and have such a great time. And then on top of that, when I came back for my master's degree, I wanted to see, I did my master's in sport physiology, which sounds completely different than psychology, but I wanted to see what it was like to have psychology and sport physiology mixed together, see what it was like to have those two mixed. So I partnered with Dr. Dula. And he helped me so much. I remember over 40 hours we spent over the course of like two or three weeks just working on this project and working on it, working on it. He spent so much time helping me out. And that meant so much to me. And not only that, but he helped so many of my friends and family that were going through hard times over the past few years. And I've been studying film for a while now. And I was like, I got to do something. I got to do a film about this guy's life. He has done so much for me. I want to do something for him, just even if it's a glimpse of everything else. So I created this film, and I think you're going to see a couple of themes throughout the film. I think, first of all, you're going to see a theme of hope, and that's hope for everybody in whatever situation, whether it's someone trying to pass a class like I was, or whether it's someone that just got a bad diagnosis or something like that. There's always hope, and I think that's one thing that Dr. Dula and Denise, his wife in this film, would love to share with you guys. And there's another thing, but I'll let them speak through this film as to what that theme is and how I think it'll affect you guys in your life. So thank you guys for coming out. And without further ado, I give you The Way of Dula, an uncommon tale of a beloved professor. We go through so many trials and tribulations, so much suffering by definition as people. In the end, you have to ask yourself, what does make it all worthwhile? My name is Dr. Chris Dula, and here is my story. I cannot go anywhere in Johnson City without someone saying, are you his wife? And of course, you know, his wife and oh we love Dr. Dula he is amazing he is the best professor that we've ever had whether it's um, going to a restaurant or a store handing them my debit card they see the name and immediately they go into a story about either him being their teacher or a story about how he's touched them or how he's made a difference in their life so he's Kind of the rock star in Johnson City. Everybody loves him. We don't like rules, so we're going to have three. Number one is we never take money to play. Number two is we never practice. Rule number three is we must have fun. Y'all have fun. Y'all have fun. That's the goal. I've been playing music since I was 13 years old, but I'm just not that good at it. Uh, but I love it. I just love playing. And so I went down to the local coffee house and just kind of started jamming. And then I started jamming with this awesome professor 
bass player Steve Marshall. And what we discovered was we just had a great time, but then we started into this kind of charity mission where we would just play for free because we all had good day jobs. The people said, don't quit your day job. And it's like, why would I? I love my day job. I have a great hobby at night, which is playing music. So anyway, the music thing became kind of a charity mission, more or less, and uh, had a great time doing good work. I was born in Charlotte, North Carolina. Pretty much everything occurred there. I thought I was born, bred, and probably be dead in Charlotte. Growing up as a child, there were no hardships. I was well taken care of. No abuse, no neglect, and material comfort. I didn't really appreciate the fact that I had these advantages. As I grew up and went into school, I became a very anti-authority personality type. I became an alcoholic at 13 years old. That was inadvertent. It was, uh, my first drink was given to me uh, by an older family member who just thought nothing of giving a 13-year-old a mixed drink, and, and I became instantly, instantly addicted. It just got worse and worse and worse. And I got into the heavy metal scene, which was all about just railing against, you know, the status quo, and that seemed to resonate with me, and to the point that I, you know, would have been unemployable in any other field except construction. I looked like a drunk ragamuffin because I was in fact a drunk ragamuffin. And I started construction as kind of the only way that I knew I was going to get a regular paycheck. And I just, I didn't have a passion for it. And so ultimately I kind of, I was, I got married to my first wife who I don't know what she saw in me, but she was a sweet and wonderful human being. I, I was 20, she was 19. So I was young dumb and a drunk and obnoxious and and ultimately I feared for her safety and told her you gotta go you gotta go and that was scary to me and that's when I became committed to becoming nonviolent. but at the same time I hadn't quite got there yet uh, I got married a second time to the woman who had a 10 year old daughter and that's a fairly complex story and really a beautiful story she moved in we got married I had this stepdaughter there was some paternal in me that I didn't know existed I never planned to have kids you know, it just it never occurred to me. But there was something about this child where she needed stability. She needed somebody who cared deeply about her to provide guidance to her. And um, I got into conflict with her mom. She's like, I'm leaving, I'm taking my daughter. And I lost the first marriage over my alcoholism. I was about to not only lose a second marriage, but this child who I knew needed me. And that, I said, don't leave. I, I will quit drinking, I will never drink again. And that's exactly what I did. That moment was my moment of truth. It's like, I quit drinking. I have never had a drink since, and that was over 25 years ago. And then my second wife also then wasn't supposed to be able to get pregnant according to medical professionals, yet she did. And so I wound up with my biological son, and I got my two children. And for all the stuff I've gone through in this world, I would say nothing is more fulfilling than having raised those two children. I never wanted to go to college. I hated high school and I didn't know that college was any different. My dad had been, my mom had been, but they never really conveyed to me like how different it was or why it would matter. I mean, all I knew is I needed to pay my bills and construction did it, but I hated it. I was faced with a real dilemma. What am I gonna do? So I started in the summer of 1992, thinking if I hate this, I'll just quit. I'll, I, yeah, I'll suck it up and go hang sheetrock because I can always do that. One of the first classes I took was in philosophy. I was blown away. I've always been a learner. I just hated high school because I didn't like people telling me what to do. But guess what they don't do in college? And so I loved it. I, I ate it up. I then got this focus that I'd never had before and, and started like, I was already making A's, but it's like, okay, I got to go to the next level. I can't just get an associate's degree. I got to go get a bachelor's degree. And then I got you know, schooled. And that process is like, you should probably go get a master's degree. And then during that process, it's like, you should probably go get a doctoral degree if you can. And it's like, it turns out when I quit drinking and I focused my energy on raising this child and then my infant son, and I was then in grad school and working on the side, it's like, that was, that was the moment where I now cared. It gave me purpose in life. And that's to be a better role model to my daughter, to be able to think down the road, I'm going to have a career that's going to take care of my kids better. Like that became a purpose for me. And then later I found out I could turn it around and give back to students and patients what I got from the process of learning all that information. 
I got my doctorate and there was a postdoctoral fellowship at University of Memphis. It was a two year job. So I could have been, stayed there for two years and, and been okay. But then the job at ETSU opened up and that was where my second wife was from. And she'd always said, you know, I wish I could go back home. Anyway, I always liked this place because I've been visiting it for years and I got the job. I started here in 04 at ETSU in Johnson City and found my purpose in life. Now, the dissolution of that marriage happened here uh, and it was pretty tragic, but at the same time it needed to happen and it did happen and so parted ways. But anyway, when, when that marriage dissolved, I was Facebooking. Because why did I get on the social media stuff? It's because all these students, my job is to teach people who are 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. And they were all on Facebook. So I was there and I saw this beautiful woman and I saw that she had a lot of interests that were really very much overlapping with mine. And I just took a risk. I was divorced for several years. And after having really, really bad um, dating issues, I had actually decided not to see anyone else. And then one day I received a message on Facebook. We did call one another and we spent our first conversation eight hours straight on the phone. It was an instant connection. We went to a restaurant in Kingsport called Giuseppe's, which was really close to where I lived at the time in Kingsport. That was it. We have been inseparable ever since. And we have never been apart since then. And we've been married six years now. And it's just amazing to me that I could have found such a woman that I actually feel like I deserve such a woman. That I've, I've made so many good corrections in my life. Like if I was who I was 25 years ago, I would not deserve this person. But at this point, I feel like not only did I deserve it, but it was supposed to be this way. But you know, people always kind of, well, some older people always talk about, no, the virtual world, these kids today, they are on their phones, they're all on, you know, they don't live in the real world. And I'm like, well, if it wasn't for the virtual world, I wouldn't be really married right now. I, I, I'm married in reality. And that happened with an assist from the virtual world because I was able, as she lived in Kingsport, I would never have met Denise had it not been for social media. And having met her on social media, I am now in the not only the healthiest and best relationship of my life, I feel like I am home. I have found the compliment of my soul. come to now is the fact that I do have a brain tumor um, and that was discovered um, in a fairly dramatic fashion but I was with my five-year-old niece who I call Lala and she's like a surrogate grandbaby to me and she's just the sweetest and smartest kid you can ever imagine we always go to this museum called hands-on regional well I was standing with her doing what we always do just hanging out I lost acuity in my lower left visual field meaning that when I looked at her, she just became like this blob-like shape. I lost all detail. And having all of my other mental processes working fine, what occurred to me is I might be having a stroke in my occipital lobe. Like the area involved in vision, right now I could be experiencing a stroke. And if that's the case, they are not kidding when they say every second matters. I said, Lala, can you help me get to Denise's office? She's like, yes. Like I knew that you could, baby. So we go to the only intersection. We stop as we always stop. She looks left. She looks right. She looks left again. She's like, we can cross. I'm like, let's hold hands and go through the zebra. She's like, okay. So we cross the crosswalk. And so, yeah, she 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 kind of led me. That's why I call her my little hero. Like, she just was so calm, cool, and collected. All of a sudden, he comes through my door in my office downtown, which is a couple of blocks away from hands-on. And he said, something's wrong. I got into Denise's office and I'm like, baby, I don't want to scare you. I have to get to medical attention now. They ordered the MRI and, and within a short period of time, of course, we found out he did have a brain tumor. And then they did a biopsy on that tumor, which is obviously what you got to do. But you don't get to any kind of area of the brain where you're taking out small pieces that you don't also take out very important pieces. That was a pretty traumatic surgery. I was in the hospital for a week at least and that was the point at which I also had some ser real serious uh, problems with sleep I couldn't remember most of this episode uh, Denise has written a journal down so when I can finally kind of think straight I can go back and see what really happened anyway ever since then I've been home I've been working every day what we know about neuroplasticity is when you lose neurons they're, they're gone but there's other ones around that that are in good shape and healthy and if you work them they'll grow he has used this whole experience to uplift 
other people to try to express that there's always hope. And he has a lot of hope. I have a lot of hope. We have a lot of faith. God has gotten me through this because without him, I just can't imagine going through this. I just want to tell people that I don't want to be too overly positive because in the sense that I am positive for sure, I've been working on my own improvement of my own core self for a long time, but I also have some, some remarkably good things going in my favor that not everybody gets. And that's unfortunate that people don't always have access to good health care, and I do. People do not always have a, a good prognosis, and I do. There's a good chance for a cure here, and I'm going to do everything I can do. But whatever I can't do, I'm going to let go and let God. I'm a man of deep and abiding faith. Uh, but for me, I know that no matter what happens, I'm going to be okay. And I'm not only going to be okay in the hereafter, one way or the other, I'm also going to be okay here now. He has such a positive outlook, and of course I try to as well. But it's scary. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what the future holds. Optimism matters. I mean, there's scientific literature that shows that, and I don't expect people to just find a silver lining in some horrible news. Uh, this is bad. Having brain cancer is a bad thing. But if there's a greater plan in it, why not make something good come out of it? It's very humbling to see um, how people have reached out to us, to me personally, to him, and I don't think there's another person in this world that deserves the love and support he's been given because he has given it so much all during his life. It, it just makes my heart happy to know that, that people are there for us and, and for him. Yeah. I was the recipient of dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and I'm, I mean seriously well-meaning loving messages on Facebook email people just going what happened what's going on how are you are you okay is there anything we can do and I, I, I couldn't even read them because I couldn't focus much less respond to them all and I thought I want to touch base with all these people who care about me maybe I could just do a video and my best friend he's like this would be a good story for Ellen I'm like I, I guess it would I have the book you know, the book was always a charity mission, right? It's like, if, if, if we could go to Ellen's show, we'll sell more books, I'll give more money away. Because that was part of what I was doing anyway. So I just did the live video to basically tell people, okay, I have a tumor, we you know, went to the hospital, I'm okay, I'm going to be okay, and here's this thing. And at this point, that video, the original one, has been viewed over 71,000 times. We, we hope that good comes out of it, no matter what happens. There are people who don't have family. Um, they, they don't have the resources to get the help they need. And, and we hope that this, you know, will bring awareness to that so that people have a little bit more empathy for others going through what he's going through right now. So back to the question, which is a great question. I mean, what makes life worth it? And for me, it comes down to one word, love. It's what you love. My love for my family drove me to become a better person and then to get the skills and abilities that gave me a job that I love, which gave me students that I love to help. It gave me patients I love to help. It gave me a sense of purpose, a mission in life. So I get to do things that I love, but it's that love that drives me on a daily basis and is sustaining me as I go through this battle with cancer is like, you know what? I'm going to get to keep teaching. I'm going to get to keep helping people. And I love doing that. And so the love that I feel for, again, my, my wife and my kids is core to who I am. But then also the broader family, the friendships, the community, the things that I get to do now, I have cultivated in myself and it's been driven by love.
everyone. We just want to thank each and every one of you, every single one of you. Your presence here means the world to us, all of us, to Dr. Dula, to his family, to us. We love you and thank you so much. And guys, let's hear it for Dr. Dula one more time. Dr. Dula, we love you so much. Guys, thank you so much once again for coming. Dr. Dula is going to make his exit, but as he's going, let's just give him just the biggest round of applause ever. Thank you, guys.